Welcome to Central Community. It's so fantastic to have you with us today on this incredibly hot day in Southern California and across the rest of our nation as we come to the very end of summer. I hope that you'll join us in worship. I want to thank you for your part in our ministries, whether it's on the streets of Los Angeles with Jackets for Jesus, whether it's in Tijuana with Siempre para los Niños, whether it's here at Central Community with our food distribution on Wednesday, or whether it's just joining us this morning for worship with Central Community, you're invited to take part and celebrate. Thank you so much for being a part this morning. Oh my Lord, you are the light by which I see. It's all about grace, your grace. you by my side. However long the night might be, it's all about grace, your grace, and all the joy that's in my heart, and the peace of God is still, since you died in my place, it's all about grace. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the goodness that you've applied to our lives this morning. We thank you for the experience of this worship now. We thank you that we can praise your name for the blessings and the opportunity of our lives, for being that Lord and Savior and that guide in our life, in our journey, and in this day. And so, Father, we give you the concerns and needs and the worries of the day, and we hand them to you so we could go through and do the things that we need to do to be able to have the relationships with our family and our friends that we ought to have. And so just guide us and give us the strength, give us the courage, give us the wisdom to be able to go in every situation and say the right things to do the right things and open up to you and to listen right now to what the Word and what our Bible and what God, your Spirit, is telling us to do and how to do it and where to go. And so, Father, we thank you for each person that is listening, each person in this building. We ask you to be with their concerns and their needs and their friends. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I was recently driving down Arlington Avenue, and as I headed home, I looked on the right-hand side of the road on the same direction I was going, except I was in the fast lane. There were cars next to me. It was 5 o'clock in the evening. It was rush hour. There were cars everywhere, and there was a man on the sidewalk having a grand mal seizure. And I immediately thought about myself. I thought, well, that could be me over there on the sidewalk. That could be me over there, and everyone was just driving by, and I found myself driving by. Because I thought, well, what would I do if I stopped? How could I help? As everyone went by, and, and I thought about how many times we want to be our best selves. How many times we long to stand tall, but what ends up happening is we fall short. And when we end up thinking about what we should have done, what we could have done, and what we would have done if we were better people, but what we failed to do in the moment that we needed to do something, because so often life is created from not that long, drawn-out plan that we thought would work out eventually when we died and we met God and we got to go to heaven, but instead of that instant where we need to make a decision right now, and if we make the wrong decision, someone's laying in the ditch as the preacher drives by, and someone's left abandoned without help. Each of us have had those moments that separate us from the love of God, that separate us from the love of our community, that separate us from ourselves because we know there's a better self than that within us, the person that we long to be. We've been teaching from Hosea for the last four weeks, and you now know that the theme of Hosea is about a prophet who 800 years ago, 750, 800 years ago, or I, I apologize, 2,800 years ago, 2,800 years ago, um, went around and he was asked by God to marry an adulterous woman. And this adulterous woman was a metaphor for Israel's relationship with God, how God had chosen someone to be close to him, chosen someone to be his own bride, and yet they were adulterous and they worshiped other gods. They refused to be faithful to him, and in the simple acts of everyday living, they neglected to stay true. And today, from some of the most beautiful teaching in Hosea, from the sixth chapter in verses one, two, and three, I want us to come and I want to think about what that invitation means to come back to God. Now, these verses I'm going to read today, you're going to hear them and you're going to think, finally, some nice verses in Hosea. You're going to hear them and you're going to think, oh, this is wonderful literature. And what you need to understand is that theologically, there are so many teachers that take this. And looking back across the millennia, they say what they're really talking about is how Israel was not just faithless, but was faithless in thinking that God was being overly gracious. And of course he would accept them back. And for us, I want you to know that there are times that I read the theologians as I prepare for a message, and I think, yeah, I think they may have it wrong on this one. I don't know. All of these guys are so smart, but I think there's a certain beauty in us as we read this together. So the text this morning from the sixth chapter of Hosea, and I, again, I would invite you to go and read the entire book of the prophet Hosea. It's a very simple, short book, one of those 12 prophets that are known as the lesser or minor prophets. Um, it's, it's a gift for each one of us. It says, come, let us return to the Lord. Just in that, in and of itself, come, let us return to the Lord. I grew up in a church where we sang a song that went, rise up, O men of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of kings. Rise up, O men of God. Come, let us Return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. Now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. 
let us press on to know him, he will respond to us as surely as the arrival of dawn or the coming of rains in early spring. Now those last words are actually where theologians get caught up in this. He will restore us as surely as the coming of dawn and as the arrival of the rains in spring. They say, see, Israel just expected too much of God. They didn't think they had to do anything. Just come back to God. Don't worry. God will restore us. If you read the RSV version, Revised Standard Version, I believe it says, in just two or three days, when I read the Revised Standard Version, I think, oh, look, this wonderful allusion to Christ Jesus being in the ground and the restoration under the Father. But theologians take it, see, they were just simplifying what it meant to come back to God. And how many of us, and I like what they're taking from a preacher's perspective, how many of us think we can just come back to God any time we want, God's always going to take us back. We can live however we want, and we don't have to worry about it because, of course, God will restore us. And I think for us to look at those very first words, this Wednesday marks Yom Kippur in the Jewish church. Now, as people come together on Wednesday at sundown, prepare for Thursday to be able to mark Yom Kippur, they'll be able to, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. It's marked in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. If you were to go back and read Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, I believe it's verse 23 through 26, something there. I mean, God commands his people to mark the Day of Atonement and to never miss it, to always mark it. This is a permanent law, it says in the scripture, that we're always to mark. It's one of those things that when we took the Old Testament, as the Christian church, we conveniently left out because Christ Jesus is our atonement. The one who makes us at one with God. But for us to remember, there are always those things in our lives where we've been injured, where life is crushed us, where we've been hurt, and it's no one's fault but our own. And we need to continually be living in that sense of atonement. We need to continually be living in that sense of rising up to be better than who we want to be. Rising up than being that person who just drives by when there's someone out on the street, in the sidewalk, struggling. And we hear the story and we think, well, of course, I would have stopped and helped. Of course, I would have done something. What kind of person wouldn't stop and help. But then we find ourselves in the middle of a busy evening. We find ourselves with some place that we know we need to get to. And we find ourselves being, oh, it's a stranger, someone I don't know. And then are we caught up in understanding there's a sense of absolute surrender that needs to take over. And so this morning, I want to spend a few minutes talking about absolute surrender and the ABCs of absolute surrender to God. Because I really believe there are some ABCs of absolute surrender to God. I want you to know that I turned around and I got up, not a block past this guy, I was in the fast lane, I turned around and came back to him. I turned around coming back assuming that by the time I got there, there would be someone stopped on the side of the road. By the time I got there, someone would have called 911. By the time I got there, there would be emergency vehicles on the way. I turned around and I stopped knowing that where I stopped between the jack in the box and the big lots, I'd be blocking traffic at rush hour. But I turned around knowing that I couldn't go home with a right spirit, I wouldn't be able to lay down my head on the pillow that night without turning around. And yet, how many things do we get consumed in? And we drive right by. Without stopping, we learn to lay our heads down on the pillow in a seeming peace without making atonement. Without saying, you know, there is something that I need to do for the things that I've done or neglected to do in my life. Because many of us become so right in our thinking that we fail to recognize all the areas that we may be wrong. 
and all the areas where we may be neglecting someone who needs us desperately. So the first um, point in the ABCs of absolute surrender to God is to accept, accept responsibility. Accept responsibility. Stop blaming others or circumstances. Stop blaming others or circumstances. At some point in our lives, we need to accept responsibility. If you go back to the fourth chapter of Hosea, this is what the prophet said to the people of Israel. He said, don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. Has that ever been you? Have you ever been the one watching everyone else drive by someone on the sidewalk, struggling, someone hurting, and you think, what a bunch of cold-hearted people, as you drive by as well? Have you ever been the one who went by the homeless encampment and thought, what a bunch of cold-hearted people, as you drive by as well? There comes a time in our lives where we need to accept responsibility. There is one person who can make the right decision for you, and that's you. No one else. I can't make the right decision for you. I can invite you to a better decision. I can show you how God's word, all the way back to 2,800 years ago, the prophet Hosea was inviting the children of Israel to say, it's time to come back. What did it say? It said, come, let us return to the Lord. Remember what was happening at that point? Judah, Israel were separated, Samaria in the middle. They were worship, worshiping the gods of Samaria. They were living an adulterous life. And here it says, come, let us return to the Lord. For us, there's that time where we have to be the ones who we stop pointing fingers and say, oh, you know, if only life hadn't dragged me down, if only I hadn't made these mistakes. If only there hadn't been this struggle for us to say, come, let us return to the Lord. And you say, oh, if only someone was coming with me. It's a beautiful thing. If you were to go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and read about it. Yom Kippur, it says this, and, and it sounds tragic, but it says anyone who fails to mark the Day of Atonement will be separated completely from the community. It doesn't say we'll be alienated from God. It doesn't say we're going to send you from hell. It says this horrible thing. You're going to be separated from the community. Imagine how heartrending that is to be separated from the community. Why do we have the tribalism in politics today in America? It's because we all want to belong to some community. And we're invited to come. Let us return to the Lord. And to do that, we need to accept responsibility for who we are. Don't point your finger at someone else and try to pass the blame. Come, let us return to the Lord. What stands in your way of returning to the Lord today? What stands in your way of having right relationship with God? What stands in your way of being part of the community that you were created for. I want you to know it's not God. God loves you, and he's gone to the very end, all the way to the cross for you, in atonement for everything that would separate you from him. It's not the people around you that seem so busy driving by those people on the side of the road who are broken and in need of help. The only thing that stands between you and right relationship with God this week is you. That's it. And for us to say, I long to accept responsibility for who I am and what I need to be in my relationship with God. I don't want to pass the blame off to anyone else. I don't want to point the finger at anyone else. You might be a preacher watching somewhere, and I'm always honored with the preachers who tell me that they've watched this message or they've been watching through Hosea. I want you to know, you know who Hosea was talking to first and foremost, the head of the people in this particular verse? He was talking to you priest. He says, you priest who have led the people astray. You priest accept responsibility because when the priest falls away, he leads the people away, he says. Because the priests are sinning, the people are sinning. 
and for you and me. We need to understand for those who have received Christ Jesus, for those who profess to live in atonement with God, when we fall away, we lead the people away. We need to accept responsibility for who we are. It's how we have the opportunity to come into absolute surrender, to atonement with God. Second, um, it says the ABCs of absolute surrender to God is to break bad habits. And bad habits, I'll tell you what, they grow on us like anything in the world. Bad habits, they become part and parcel to who we are. But you see, when we break bad habits, then we need to develop God-honoring disciplines. And to break those bad habits that pull us away from God, and we think about way back 2,800 years ago, Hosea wrote this, alcohol and prostitution have robbed my people of their brains. Alcohol and prostitution have robbed my people of their brains. My mom would have had this verse written on every single mirror in the household, so us kids would have had to look at it every single morning. Alcohol, stay away from it, and prostitution have robbed my people of their brains. We don't relate to it, but Samaria, what they taught was to have prostitutes, temple prostitutes, all the way around the temple. And so the Jews began to copy this. And around their synagogues, they began to have temple prostitutes. That when the men came, they utilized these temple prostitutes. And then they would go out and drink. And the alcohol robbed their brains. The prostitutes robbed their lives as they surrendered themselves to worshiping that which was of the world and that which was not of God. When you're serving bad habits that take you away from God, when you look at yourself and you evaluate your life honestly, and that's what a Day of Atonement is about, that's what Yom Kippur is about in the Jewish faith, is to come to a day to take a deep breath and to say, you know, how can I improve myself? Who have I harmed? Who do I need to make atonement with? How do I find my peace with God? Because if you're not at peace with someone else, it's really hard to be at peace with God. And to take that time so that you can move forward into this new year and celebrate the opportunity of breaking these bad habits. Rosh Hashanah, I told you about last week, the new year, it, it's never been something that I've marked particularly, except for the community that I grew up in. But Yom Kippur, I've always tried to mark because I think it's essential to who we are as a people to be able to say, I want to evaluate one more time who I am, my relationship with God. It's not that I don't think Christ Jesus went to the cross and atoned for my sins, and it's not that I think that somehow I can add to that atonement that was once and for all. It's that I believe that through my actions, I can separate myself from God. And I don't want to be separated from God. I want to make sure if there's someone that I've harmed, if there's someone that I need to be right with, that I go ahead and I do that. That I take the time to, if there's some part of me that's separating me from my Father God, I want to be right in that regard. It says, in just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. This is going all the way back to the fourth chapter of Hosea. But I couldn't go by without using these texts. In just a short time, he will restore us. Rise up, O church of God. Have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. To rise up, you need to let go. To rise up, you need to release. For each of us to understand that requires breaking those bad habits that would hold us down, those things that abuse us. And finally, the ABCs of absolute surrender to God are complete commitment. Complete commitment to our first and our highest calling. Now, 
Here's the challenge that most of us have. I'm guessing if I were to ask you to write down what your first and highest calling in life has been or is today, you would have a difficult time doing it. And you see, we need to be able to write it down in a simple sentence. What is your first and highest calling? Is it to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength? And to love your neighbors just as much? I mean, is that your first and highest calling, the golden rule? What's your first and highest calling? If that's it, if you're saying, yeah, that's it, Pastor Eric, then how are you putting that to work? What does that practically mean on a daily basis in your life? Here at Central Community, we give people all kinds of ways. I am a great believer that everybody wants to do something good with their life. They just usually don't know how. And so we have Jackets for Jesus that goes to the heart of Los Angeles. Tonight we'll be in the heart of Los Angeles, and there will be people serving the homeless on the streets of Los Angeles. We have Siempre para los Niños. That actually was an outgrowth of us building a church in Mexico. We have the church in Mexico that, as we're meeting right now, Sunday school and the children at the church in Mexico are gathering down there right now. We have a church we were talking about earlier in Runo, Kenya. Look it up on Google Earth. I challenge some other, try to find, are you in O, Kenya? We're John and Monica, pastor. I, I can't wait to go back to Runo. In fact, the last few times I've tried to go, haven't even been able to get out there when I was there two years ago. It's so far out in the middle of nothing. It's on the edge of nothing, and we've had the, there are places for you to work. We have the food distribution ministry, where you have the opportunity to be a part of packing, where you have the opportunity to distribute. You have the opportunity to come in and be a driver, to come in and be someone who's finding new ways for us to get food and building new networks and work with Josh and Marty and Ken and the others who are continuing to grow this out. There are practical ways, the worship team, where you have the opportunity to come in and work and worship, greeting people as the doors continue to open up wider. I get Sunday school with Trisha. Trisha's going to be gone for the next couple weeks on vacation. I'm assuming Darlene's going to be over there. And so we have all the different things where you have the opportunity to come and love and lift people up in ministry and say, this is my first and highest calling, and I do not put it aside. Do you know what your first and highest calling for God is today? Because if you know your first and highest calling, it's going to make all of those other decisions, like when you drive by the man on the sidewalk having a seizure, it's going to make that decision so much easier. Hosea 4.18 says this, their love for shame is greater than their love for honor. Ooh, ouch. Doesn't that just sound like the world today? Their love for shame is greater than their love for honor. But then we come back to this morning's text. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. But you see, here you've got these contrasting images of Israel 2,800 years ago. I mean, their love for shame is greater than their love for honor. They're occupied by their love for alcohol and prostitution. And yet, oh, that we may know the Lord. Oh, that we may be drawn close to him. Let us, what does it say? Press on to know him. Let us press on to know him. I blocked the lane of traffic. I got out of my car. I saw the man having a seizure. He was now laying level and unconscious on the sidewalk. It was probably 102 degrees outside, even at 5 o'clock. I went up to him. His eyes were closed. I didn't know what I was going to find, whether he was alive, whether he was dead, what it was. And I realized he recogni I recognized him. He's a homeless man in our community. And then I started wondering if he had had heat stroke. They had a seizure from heat stroke. He was laying there. He had a blanket. He was laying on a blanket on, Lord only knows how hot that sidewalk was, on the sidewalk with a blanket over him. And I reached over and I put my hand on him. I said, hey, hey, are you Okay. His eyes opened up, and he saw me. He recognized me immediately. 
I throw him off our campus on a pretty regular basis. He saw me, so he got up, and he acted like he needed to leave. He tried to get up, but he couldn't get up. Like he needed to leave, like, oh, maybe I'm at the church, and I'm getting thrown out. And I said, no, no you don't have to go anywhere, man. He said, I just stopped to make sure you're okay. Do you want me to call 911 so we can get an ambulance? And from underneath the blanket, he pulled up this two-liter container of Sprite. Maybe Pastor Ken gave it to him. I don't know where he got it. It was about half empty, so he'd been drinking it. And he just started gulping it down like a man in the desert. And as he drank it down, I said, can you sit up? And he sat up for a minute. He looked at me. I said, do you want me? No, no, don't call 911. And then he laid back down on the sidewalk and pulled a blanket up over himself and fell asleep exhausted. I knew he didn't want 911 to come. I knew he didn't want to go to a hospital. And so I bided by what I knew this man would want, and I left it laying on the sidewalk. I drove away, and nobody else stopped. And I left him there knowing the man, knowing who he was, offering him something, I didn't feel nearly as guilty about leaving him there until I got home and Debbie and I started making dinner together. And I thought about the relationship I have for over 40 years with my wife, thought about the beautiful home we have. I thought about how we were cooking dinner together. I'm gonna sit down and eat more food than we could use if we wanted to thought about the three empty bedrooms in our house. I thought about that we have bathtubs and showers that no one even gets into in our house. How he could have come home with me. And I thought about how every single week I'm with the homeless in downtown LA. Debbie's the one who would bring home the homeless. Debbie brought them home when I would tell her the stories and she would bring them home with us. And then a friend of mine told me this on the street. She said, Eric, he was sick, and Debbie asked me to bring him home. He said, Eric, don't ever take me home with you. I said, well, why not, V? He said, well, this is what would happen. He said, for the first two or three days, it would be great. Debbie would take care of me. I would be sick, and then I would get better. And then I'd steal your TV set, and I'd sell it for heroin. He said, I'm a heroin addict, Eric. You don't want to take me home with you. It wouldn't be a good thing. I said, but D, we would just watch over so he didn't steal our TV. And he said, no, don't take me home with you. And then I thought about us as a community, the community of God. What are we to do about those who are still on the sidewalk, who are still lost? Not lost spiritually or not lost to God, but lost from us because we haven't come up with a solution. You see, there comes a time where it requires total surrender. And that's the ABC of total surrender. That's the accepting responsibility. That's the breaking our bad habits. And then that's the complete commitment to our first and highest calling. I left him to live in his own struggle because I assumed, well, that was a struggle he wanted to live in or he wouldn't have chosen it and drove away. When you turn off the message today and go to drink your cup of coffee, I'm going to leave you to your own struggle in the same way. No different than that man on the sidewalk. Spiritually just as abandoned, spiritually just as apart from God, unless you make a decision to say, I want more. I want to be restored to God unless you say, come, let us be restored to God. Unless you say, I want to receive the atonement with God that I have in Christ Jesus, and then the atonement with each other by going ahead and making things right. Simple prayer at the bottom of your card this morning that might be exactly the prayer that you need. It says, forgive me, Lord. I've fallen short, and I want to stand tall in you. I believe that only you can save me. I've gone my own way, turning the wrong direction. I know I need you. Come into my heart and save me.
thing. God allowed me to pass by that man. God did not allow me to go by without making a U-turn. And had I not made that U-turn, today my life would be very different. I would feel so much colder. And I worry about a world that drove by. God allows you to make a U-turn in your life today. I don't know who it is or what it is that you've been leaving on the street. But God is inviting you to make a U-turn. And if you're in that spot today where you feel the Holy Spirit touching your heart, and you know that you've been the one who's been pointing a finger at someone else, and it's time for you to break the bad habit that you need to break. It's time for you to come alongside and have complete commitment to your first and highest calling. There's no time like this week, the week of Yom Kippur, a day of atonement, to be able to say, God, I'm here for you, whatever you want. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you so much for these ancient words from Hosea. We thank you so much for the healing that comes in them, God. We think about the people we drive by on a daily basis, living on the streets, sleeping on the streets, being sick on the streets. And we think about the people that we walk by who look like they're healthy, who fit in like they're whole, but we know that they're apart from the community. And most of all, without pointing our fingers at anyone else, God, we think about ourselves and how often we've lived our lives pointing our fingers and blaming someone else without accepting responsibility for who we are. Lord Jesus, for that one who this morning feels your spirit at their heart's door, for that one who this, mo this morning longs for restoration unto your community and unto you, God, for that one who knows they're the one who needs to be making atonement this week, God, because you've atoned them unto yourself through your son, Christ Jesus. I would ask that you would move with your grace, Holy Spirit, that where we can't go but that this message is going, that you would use it, that you would change lives, that you would draw us together, that we might be one. I thank you for protecting your word, God, across the millennia. I would ask that you would continue to protect it until your church is one, that we rise up together, and that we're home with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for being a part of Central Community. You know, you can be a member of Central Community from wherever you're at, whether you're in Bruno, Kenya, whether you're in Tijuana, Mexico, whether you're in downtown LA, whether you're in Riverside, California, wherever you're at, you can be a member of Central Community just by receiving Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, just by saying, I long to be a part, I want to be a part of a community that believes in that atonement that comes from God and will restore me unto myself, unto others, and unto God's kingdom. You can be a part of that, and this is a dynamic community to be a part of every Sunday at 10 o'clock if you live in the area. You can be here for our 10 a.m. service. You can be here with that elect few that come for the 8.45 a.m. service. They slip in at 8.45. They have to watch me preach to a camera the whole time while I kind of ignore them. May God richly bless them. You can be, do that. Their coffee and donuts are at 10 a.m. You can be here where we have um, a much larger group gathered together. You're able to be a part of that service. Um, this afternoon, Jackets for Jesus will be gathering together in the kitchen at 3 o'clock to start cooking. If you would like to help Jody and Ron and Patty and the team over there prepare for Jackets for Jesus, come on out. I don't remember what they're having tonight, but I'm sure it's going to... Uh, they're having enchilada casserole tonight. I just remembered. Enchilada casserole and corn on the cob. You can come out. You can help them make that. We're going to serve it on the streets of Los Angeles tonight. You can be a part of that. We're leaving um, Central Community by 7.30 this evening. Come on out. Be a part. Join us to go to the streets of L.A. We'll be on the streets. We need to be fully vaccinated on the streets of Los Angeles. It's essential. The, the cities put out 
mandates for all of us now on the streets of LA, and so it's important. You wouldn't believe almost all of the homeless have been vaccinated, and so you're invited to be a part of that. They'll ask you if you come and you stand in line, whether you are or not, but you're a part of that. Come on out, serve with us on the streets of LA tonight. We won't be back until around midnight or 12.30. You're invited to be a part of that. Tuesday morning, we'll be picking up food at 1040. We'll be back here at the church by 1130 or so. The packing team will be ready by noon to start packing. You can be a part of that packing team Wednesday morning. Pastor Ken's on vacation, so I'm guessing Josh and Marty and Mike and all those guys who are going to be pulling out food would love it if you were here at like 6 o'clock or 630 to help them get everything out there before it's hot. Make sure everything's in order so that we can have it ready and start distributing it. We have been down a couple of volunteers each week for the last couple of weeks. It is a joyous thing to hand out food for free and to watch the hundreds of people go through and receive food for the week to come for their families. God is richly blessing it. Continue to pray for Siempre para los Niños. Pastor Ken went through and gave it a thorough walk through this week, our orphanage in Mexico. And even this morning, I saw him correspondence with our director down there, Yara. Pray for them. Pray for just the physical. Um, it's no small building. I mean, it's over 40,000 square feet of buildings. So it's a lot of buildings. It's a lot of attention that needs to take care. It's a lot of finance and it's a bunch of kids that go on. And one of the things that we should never forget that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, there are people in the orphanage that we built attending to it all that we need to care for we need to lift up in prayer so pray for the children they're still not their schools are not open yet because um COVID-19 is still rampaging through Tijuana so be in prayer that they can soon be back in school may God richly bless you thank you so much for being part of Central Community this morning <laughs>